before we begin and welcome our Michelle Christie, a reading from the voice of the silence. Have patience, candidate, as one who fears no failure, courts no success. Fix thy soul's gaze upon the star whose ray thou art, the flaming star that shines within the lightless depths of ever being the boundless fields of the unknown. Have perseverance as one who doth forevermore endure. Thy shadows live and vanish. That which in thee shall live forever, that which in thee knows, for it is knowledge, is not a fleeting life. It is the man that was, that is, and will be, for whom the hour shall never strike. If thou wouldst reap sweet peace and rest, disciple, sow with the seeds of merit the fields of future harvests. Accept the woes of birth. Step out from sunlight into shade to make more room for others. The tears that water the parched soil of pain and sorrow bring forth the blossoms and the fruits of karmic retribution. Out of the furnace of man's life and its black smoke, winged flames arise, flames purified that soaring onward neath the karmic eye, weave in the end the fabric glorified of the three vestures of the past. Our own Michelle Christie. Before I begin, I would like to say that the study of the Zodiac takes lifetimes to gain any kind of clear picture. Even then, the true secrets of the heavens are only known by initiates and sages. Mostly all of what we have in regard to the Zodiac has been passed down from sages of old and has been heavily veiled. And this has come down through all the cultures in the world with varying degrees of authenticity. Today, there is a plethora of information out there on the subject. And though there are many elements of truth in, in all of these sources, as far as this beginning student can see, all of the information out there is considered to be completely exoteric knowledge. If it is written in a book and can be accessed by anyone, it is surely to be ex exoteric. We always need to look towards that which is hidden that which cannot be explained through words, and the true mysteries of such matters need to be contemplated within. Some knowledge of astrology was given out in the 1875 cycle from H.P. Blavatsky and from William Quan Judge, but for the most part, it still remains mostly veiled at this time. William Quan Judge famously stated that the Bhagavad Gita and the Zodiac were the two lost keys. Many people have presented all kinds of treatises on the subject since the 1875 cycle, but I am choosing to present information tonight from the lineage in which I trust, Nam namely that which has been given during the 1875 cycle from HPB and from Judge, and also that which was given during the 1975 cycle by Helen Valborg and Sri Raghavan Iyer. The symbol articles that were written by Helen Valborg are so rich. They contain much that is heavily veiled, but in her words, one can see a clear zodiacal key and a true companion to the study of the secret doctrine. I highly recommend to anyone who is wishing to know more about the Zodiac after tonight to read her articles, which were published in a book called Theosophical Astrology by Theosophy Trust. The book can be purchased through Amazon. You can find all the articles free of charge 
on theosophytrust.org under the page called Symbols. Since the subject of astrology is so vast, I chose for tonight's meeting to focus on more of the pure archetypes of the zodiac as it relates to the secret doctrine and the pilgrimage of the soul, rather than any kind of personality interpretation. We will then weave our way through each of the 12 signs of the zodiac and end with looking at those signs in relationship to each other. And hopefully there will be plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. Now here on our opening slide, you can see that the correlation quote from the Aquarian Almanac this week, which comes from Hermes, says, the zodiac symbolizes an entire cosmic cycle of evolution and dissolution. The zodiacal signs are ideographs and hieroglyphs with number, color, and tone. And here we have stanza seven from The Secret Doctrine. Behold, the beginning of sentient, formless life. The hierarchy of creative powers is divided into seven, or four and three, esoteric, within the 12 great orders, recorded in the 12 signs of the zodiac. The seven of the manifesting scale being connected, moreover, with the seven planets. All this is subdivided into numberless groups of divine, spiritual, semi-spiritual, and ethereal beings. And this comes from Sri Raghavan Iyer from his article on integration and recurrence in the Gupta Vidya, Volume 3. In order to understand the activity and overlapping of cycles on any broad scale, one must adopt a, adopt a set of categories that has nothing to do with the perceptions and propensities of the personal nature. To the integrative and synthetic vision of, of the adept, the interplay and interaction of human beings on the terrestrial plane are resolved into the occult correspondences of sounds, colors, and numbers. Individual human beings are seen as having monbantaric stars, or rays of individuality, which pertain to them throughout the vast cycle of their incarnations. Within each incarnation, that individuality takes up a personal existence connected with a personal star or ray. And now we're going to be looking over the differences between the tropical and the sidereal zodiacs. Very often you might hear the sidereal zodiac referenced as the Vedic zodiac, but really there are differences between the Western and the Eastern systems. So here you can see that we have the, the poles of heaven and earth. We have the celestial pole and the ecliptic pole. And as you can see, the ecliptic pole is off center. The earth rotates on its axis at an angle to the ecliptic plane, also known as the zodiacal belt. The north ecliptic pole falls in the constellation of Draco currently, the dragon near the cat's eye nebula. But as time passes, the celestial north pole will slowly shift and be centered on a different star. This is called the precession of the equinoxes. Here in the diagram, you can see the star Polaris is currently aligned with the celestial North Pole. Polaris is the brightest star in the constellation of Ursa Minor, which you might also know as the Little Dipper or the Little Bear. And the North Pole can be symbolized in a way as our guiding compass um, for collective humanity. Um, we can all be said to be kind of looking upward towards the guiding divinity. And this will be under the particular star 
which is above and on the celestial North Pole, depending on the particular cycle. So here you can see that currently the celestial equator and the ecliptic equator are currently off by 23 and a half degrees. Now, if we put this then on a zodiacal wheel, as though when we're doing a chart, um, you can see here that we have the, um, the outer wheel is going to represent the tropical zodiac, the Western system. And the inner ring is going to represent the sidereal zodiac. And so because there is this difference um, by 23 and a half degrees, there's a lot of debate currently um, within the scientific and the astrological communities. And this has been going on for centuries. So the current scientific theory doesn't really recognize the zodiac much at all. Um, but in um, part of that is due to the discrepancies between the Western and Eastern systems. And so therefore, they tend to kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. But the, the Western tropical zodiac um, was developed at the time when both of the sidereal and the tropical were perfectly aligned. In other words, if if you were born on the first day of spring, the sun would be at zero degrees Aries. But fast forward to the present day. Throughout time, due to the precession of the equinoxes, the two systems have diverged by almost a whole sign. So therefore, the, the same person who thought that their sun was in Aries, um, in tropical Aries, actually has their sun in the previous sign, the sign of Pisces. And now there's a lot of debate between these two systems, but I think the most basic question is what, which system is really true? And I think both, both are true. Archetypally, the tropical zodiac is aligned symbolically to the seasons. So in a, in a real sense, um, Aries, which is kind of a symbol of the beginning of the entire zodiacal wheel, and that in the tropical zodiac, it aligns perfectly with the spring equinox and so on throughout the signs. And so in a real sense, you can say that, that there is a real reason why Aries would be aligned with the spring equinox. And I think a good way that you could possibly remedy this is to use the tropical zodiac and take into account conjunctions of fixed stars. Um, or you can use the sidereal zodiac and take into account more of the archetypal nature of it. Now, there will be certain cases and certain degrees where the tropical and the sidereal overlap. And you can see this in the image. So, for example, if if one is born with the sun at 28 degrees of tropical Aries, then in the sidereal system, the sun will still be in the constellation of Aries, but at the fourth degree rather than the 28th. So really, when all things are said and done, regardless of what system someone uses, it's really just a map. And it's more up to the development of the astrologer, the, the intuitional faculties that, um, that an individual has gained in order to sift through and use a map properly and come to the best conclusions. Now, next, we're going to be going through the briefly the astrological ages. So currently, um, the, press, the processional cycle moves backwards from Aries to Pisces, from Pisces to Aquarius, and Aquarius to Capricorn, and so on. And so this cycle, it takes 25,920 years to make its full round. Now, HPB in the Secret Doctrine gives the, the figure of 25,868, 
But as we know, there are many intentional blinds that are given in the secret doctrine. What we do know currently today, mathematically, is that it takes 72 years for the procession to move by one degree. Now, if you take 72 multiplied by 360 degrees, that will equal 25,920 years. Now, if we divide that number by 12, we will get 2,160 years, which is roughly the approximate length of each zodiacal age. And again, HPB gives the number of 2,155 years. Um, but we can we can also assume that this is also a blind. It's really off by, um, you know, about five years. So it's quite close. And now you can see that the, the entire cycle takes just under 26,000 years to get to its original position. Now, for the Aquarian age, there are many dates that are given for the supposed beginning of the, Aquari the age of Aquarius. And even among different theosophical groups, um, some of these dates can be very wide ranging. Some groups don't even believe that the Aquarian age has begun yet and won't for another hundred years or so. But again, I, I must return to the sources that I trust um, namely HPB and the information that was given in the 1975 cycle. So there is one reference that's given from HPB in regard to the Aquarian Age, and this was published in Lucifer in 1887, and it comes from the article called Esoteric Character of the Gospels. Quote, there are several remarkable cycles that come to a close at the end of this century. First, the 5,000 years of the Kali Yuga cycle. Again, the Messianic cycle of the Samaritan, also Kabbalistic Jews, of the man connected with Pisces. It is a cycle, historic and not very long, but very occult, lasting about 2,155 solar years. It occurred in 2410 and 255 BC, or when the equinox entered into the sign of the ram, and again into that of Pisces. When it enters in a few years the sign of Aquarius, psychologists will have some extra work to do, and the psychic idiosyncrasies of humanity will enter on a great change. So we're also given in the 1975 cycle, the exact date. And so this is, of course, in line with the information that was given by HPB. She was basically saying there that at the end of the um, 1900s, that the Aquarian age would be beginning around that time. And so in the 1975 cycle, we were given the date of June 19th, 1902. Now, this is about two and a half years after the close of the century. And so it's quite a reasonable date to accept given the huge shift that has occurred in consciousness since then. And one of the, um, just on a very fundamental, basic level, we can see that consciousness has vastly shifted. Um, even the most common form of travel today used to be, when it used to be, um, through boats. Nowadays, it's through flight. And because Aquarius is associated with air and kind of vertical ascent, um, you can make this correlation quite easily. Another really good um, explanation as well is we see this incredible um, and exponential growth um, when we've come into the 20th century and especially now in the 21st with technology. And Aquarius is said to rule technology. And so I think that this is a, a pretty fair date for the beginning of the Aquarian age. And it's completely in line um, with what HPB 
has given us. Now, the first degree of the age of Aquarius passed on June 19th, 1974, right before the very beginning of the 1975 cycle. So that's an interesting correlation, to say the least. We're, we are currently at one degree and 41 seconds as of today, June, uh, January 20th, 2024. Um, currently, um, 120, 21 years have passed since that, since that beginning date. Now, we will be in the age of Aquarius until roughly around the year 4062, in which we will be entering into the age of Capricorn, which is also um, mentioned as the age of Makara, which is the Sanskrit name for Capricorn. Now, this age is said to be the age of creative magic. And so we can see why it would be incredibly important that humanity learn some of the lessons um, in which Aquarius uh, represents before that um, next age. So now we're going to be going over the um, zodiacal archetypes. We'll weave our way through each of the 12 signs. Now, I do want to say that um, much of my understanding of the zodiac as it relates to theosophical astrology has come from the writings of Helen Valborg. And so I'm going to be leaning quite heavily on her writings. Um, so any reference or quotation um, that I say moving forward in this section, they can all be found um, with the corresponding article under that sign in the book of Theosophical Astrology. Now here is a, a quote from Helen Valborg from her article on the clock. Um, it was published in the Aquarian Almanac for, um, for the week of the clock in at the end of November of last year. Quote, man is a sevenfold potential god who must progress around the 12 signs of the celestial clock until he has mastered the forces of each one of them in his own nature. Now man is truly the microcosm of the macrocosm. You can see here the divine proportions of man can be seen as stretched along the zodiacal wheel with the head in the sign of Aries and the feet in Pisces. So each of the 12 signs is said to rule a specific area of the body um, in man. And these are usually the correspondences that are given. So we can see that the living symbols which lie within the zodiac, that they're, they're really an expression um, as a whole. Um, they're really an expression of the involution and evolution of man. From Aries to Virgo, we can see an involution of spirit into matter. This is symbolized um, by the virgin, Virgo, who like the myth, um, there are many myths, but like the myth in Persephone, uh, she descends into the underworld of matter. And then you can see at the very bottom, Libra is at the balance point, uh, which is the symbol is the scales for Libra. Um, but in the East, um, the sign of Libra is very often Nara Narayana, the eternal man who stands in the balance. And from Libra to, to Pisces, is the reascent back from matter into pure spirit. It's said that the pilgrim soul takes birth in each of the zodiacal signs, um, probably many times um, through each 
zodiacal sign. And I'm not exactly sure the inner workings of um, if this goes in a, in a clear progression or how many times we go through this wheel, but it's, it's probably many times. Um, so we go, we take birth and each of these signs in order to go throughout our journey of reascent back to our home or our father in heaven. Now, beginning with Aries, Aries is the first sign in the zodiac. Its symbol is the ram, and it's said to be the aperture through which the sacrificial emanation commences. The cosmic vision is lost along with the awareness of the real nature. And this is related to Aja, the cosmic self. Aries vibrates with the force of its personified ray. The element which rules Aries is fire, and the ruling planet is Mars. Aries is very closely associated with Leo and Sagittarius, which are the, the two other fire signs in the zodiac. And we can see that Aries is kind of more of a primal fire, which eventually is tamed and then refined in the signs of Leo and then in Sagittarius. Now, quote, the energy of fire incarnate polarizes and concentrates and is the cause of all separations and reunions in matter. As consciousness, it gathers into a strong sense of self, which is limited, its movements manifesting as death and rebirth. The spiritual fire becomes locked in the present personality by the centrifugal and heterogeneously separative force of Mars, whose influence promotes the gathering process of soul involution, which will persist through the critical point of Scorpio. End quote. Now, this sacrificial emanation kind of envelops the soul in this matrix of avidya or ignorance. And um, I'd also like to say that each of the zodiacal signs directly corresponds to each of the 12 Buddhist nidanas, which are also called the 12 causes of existence. Now, for Aries, the Buddhist nidana that's associated with it is avidya or ignorance. And so you can imagine that the soul has just been um, kind of emanated into um, into avidya, into ignorance. And the soul is essentially un unknowing and standing naked, um, so to speak. And from this immersion in avidya, the soul begins searching. And through the initiatory nature of the primal fire of Aries, it lights up the phohotic spark of aspiration. Quote, the uninterrupted practice of the awareness of the real is the means of dispersion of avidya. End quote. This fire of aspiration brings on a purification of the soul, which is incredibly necessary in order to push forward while further descending on its journey. Now next, the second sign of the zodiac is Taurus. Its symbol is the bull, and it represents impressed matter of past thoughts and desires, or former states of being, and the karmic residues that the soul must eventually transform. It's related to the second nadana of samskara. Quote, samskara et etymologically suggests the improvement and refinement of impressions left upon the mind and form. It carries the germs of propensities cultivated in previous lives to be developed in this and future births. Linked to Vak, Taurus establishes the keynote and basis for subsequent activity, end quote. And so the ruling planet of Taurus is Venus, which gives it a kind of feminine, a feminine type of coloring to this sign. Um, the seven stars of the Pleiades also reside in this sign. 
And they're identified with the seven rishis who govern the seven races of man. The kind of fixed nature of Taurus can often give a Tomasic kind of nature. But once this becomes refined, there is an incredible ability for assimilation and illumination. The soul that's under the influence of Taurus must learn to assimilate and ruminate and become one-pointed in purpose. We can think of the symbol of the eye of the bull. The initial aspiration that is brought in through Aries kind of needs that quality of earth and the fixed modality um, in order to kind of coalesce and become singular and firm in focus. Now, the third sign of the zodiac is called Gemini, and its symbol is the celestial twins. Now, here in Gemini, there's kind of a further descent or involution in consciousness, and then the Nadana that's associated with Gemini is called Vijnana, or eye consciousness. Quote, the budding self-consciousness of androgynous Gemini becomes focused on the distinction between the objective and the subjective. Consciousness begins to trace out impressions upon the fine veil of matter. The heavenly twins express opposites fused together, like twin beams from one light, end quote. Now, Castor and Pollux, which are the stars um, that represent the twins in um, in this constellation. They're called the celestial twins. Um, they were both termed the starry one and the lightful one. Um, the starry one is known as Castor, and the lightful one is, is uh, Pollux. Now the residing planet is um, Mercury, and the, the, the ruling element is air. And this kind of gives the Gemini its association with the higher and lower mind. Um, Castor is, you can think of Castor as the earthly mortal twin that represents lower Kamamas. And Pollux is the heavenly spirit or the immortal twin that represents the higher Buddhimanas. Quote, Gemini is a symbol of the higher and lower mind points to the process whereby the whole of evolving existence leads to the pivotal point inherent in the dual nature of man, end quote. In the Vedic system of nakshatras, the 28 lunar mansions, the celestial twins of Castor and Pollux, they reside in um, what's called Punarvastu, and this takes up a portion of the Gemini constellation. So the nakshatra of Punarvasu is you can it can be symbolized as the return of um, the return of light and of exile, or the the journey away from home, or the restoration of oneself in isolation, and yet returning home with this light. And so um, Punarvasu Punarvasu is also considered to be. Um, the star of Rama, who was beloved, and yet he was also ca cast out into exile. And the, the kind of mutable modality of Gemini suggests that the lessons that the soul can learn um, under the influence of this sign is a flexibility, um, a fl flexibility of mind, as well as a firmness. Um, so this kind of flexibility but also at the same time, a firmness that's needed in order to um, realign the inverted mind or restore um, towards the immortal, what is immortal and real. Now, the fourth sign of the zodiac is cancer, and this is symbolized by the crab. Now, in ancient Egypt, um, the symbol for cancer was the scarab beetle. And the, the glyph, if you look down in the colored area that's highlighted there, um, 
the glyph, that's the glyph for cancer. And it resembles the number six and nine, kind of suggesting the yin yang qualities, the, um, the archetype of the feminine and the masculine. Now the moon is the ruling planet for cancer, as well as the element of water. And this signifies the reflective waters that are needed to mirror the will of the overbrooding host of the fifth hierarchy. Quote, for while the sun brings life to the entire solar system, the moon influences only our earth. It is a diminished and reflected extension of solar powers, but totally focused upon our globe. Governed by the moon in the performance of its symbolic role as a mediator between the formless and form filled worlds. End quote. So, this was this idea was kind of beautifully exemplified by H.P. Blavatsky. And many people believe that her son was actually in the sign of Leo um, because of her kind of strong personality, but actually, sidereally. Um, the sun at the time of her birth was in the constellation of Cancer. Um, quote from um, the Cancer article, uh, the astral essence given forth to the world by H.P. Blavatsky was given freely so that men could partake of, so, I'm sorry, um, so the astral essence given forth to the world by H.P. Blavatsky was, was given freely not so that men could partake of more names and forms, but so that they could gain access to the solar impress, which the substance of her consciousness so generously conveyed. Like the Queen Moon, she faithfully reflected the light of the great Dian Chohans and her entrance into the world was made through the gate of the human soul, the northern gate of the sun, end quote. Now you can see here that cancer is directly opposite the what's um, symboled here in the slide as the purple um, symbol. The opposite of cancer is Capricorn, and the Capricorn sign is a very mysterious sign that is linked to the Dian Chohans. And so you can see Cancer here, directly opposite it, is kind of reflecting, um, standing as the moon to the sun. Now the Nadana that's associated with Cancer is called Nama Rupa, which means name and form. And this is associated with the personality or the mask. And the modality of one, um, the modality of cancer is of, um, it's called the cardinal sign, which brings this initiatory action. And the great lesson to be learned from the force of cancer teaches us that the mask is false and that the form is hollow. And ultimately, the play or the lila, the, the, the divine lila, is um, or the outward lila is unreal and so again we have to learn to look within um that the the moon that comes the light that comes from the moon isn't the real light um, we need to look towards the sun not to the moon Now, Leo is the fifth sign of the zodiac, and it's famously symbolized by the lion. The element that rules Leo is fire, and the modality is fixed. Um, you could also think of it as tamasic in a way, but I, I, I wouldn't think of the fixed nature as um, kind of the the really negative traits of what we normally associate with tamas. Um, here we could see it more as a subdued nature in a way. That's what the, um, that's what Leo is trying to bring forth in us in a way. Um, or put in another way, if you look at the, the, the element of fire and the fixed modality, you can say that the fire 
that resides in Leo is more of a regal type of fire, a controlled fire, um, rather than the kind of primal fire, fire that we have in Aries um, and the refined nature of fire that we get eventually in Sagittarius. Now, the sun rules this sign, and there's a correlation with the heart to the sign of Leo. Um, just as the sun is the heart of our solar system, Leo connects the mystery of the hidden fire of the spiritual sun to the fire that lights the spiritual heart in man. Quote, a connection between the heart and the eye is analogously suggested by the ancient Egyptian belief that the eye of the sun was the great lion form of Shu. End quote. In ancient times, it was believed that Leo kind of kindles the fire of passion, which will spark the final pilgrimage of the human soul. And here's another quote here. Um, From the zodiacal phase, marking the painful fall of pure spirit into conditioned manifestation that takes place in Aries, the vital spark of divine light spreads throughout the finest matrix of Akasha. From the mother, Vak, through the guise of Taurus, manifested universal Mahat. The androgynous, connect, connect, the androgynous consciousness of the emerging microcosm. From this consciousness impressed upon the mother deep arose the astral plan of the names and forms to be. Cancer does this kind of work of unfolding. All this was then vivified by the spirit beyond, from beyond um, manifested life, the fiery breath and the electric fire of all life, which in our world system is the visible life-giving sun, end quote. Now, Leo corresponds to the Nadana called Sadhyatana. Sad means six in Sanskrit, and Atana means powers of perception. These comprise the five physical senses, as well as the mind as the sixth, and that's the, um, the sixth is of mental perception. So the sensations that we have become feelings, which act upon the mind and then engender um, more emotion. The sensations sparked by the interaction um, of the mind kind of gather force in Leo and are the vehicles um, through which this, the final separation takes place, or you could think of it as the philosophical death that takes place in the sign of Scorpio. And here's another quote here. The soul is propelled forward into the realm of limitation where it experiences passion and pain. This fiery force spreads through every atom of existence and spills over into the receptive soil of Virgo, the Virgin, who is inseparable from Leo and who marks the last signs of the zodiac, which are the agents of spiritual involution. The fire which builds the prison is also that which releases. Within the mystical heart of the seeker, The fire of passion that's born in Leo must be purified so that its heat gradually reduces to ashes the thraldom of identification with name and form, which comes, which came in in the sign of cancer. The separate bonfires of delusive emotion must be refined and unified within the well of universal selfhood. It is not the separate self that slays the devouring beast. It is the pure fire of the white lion, the holy force of the divine Dhyanis, working through human vestures that conquers the foe, end quote. So now I'd like to, in in this slide, I'd like to discuss a little bit about um, what's known as the old zodiac. Um, So in, in ancient times, before the separation of the sexes took place, um, the zodiac was said to hold only 10 signs. And you can see that um, those 10 signs um, 
went from Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and then Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio were all condensed into one. And then it would go over to Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. And here's a quote from Helen Valborg. This is from her article in the Pentagram. She says, before the zodiacal signs of Kanya, which is the Sanskrit name for Virgo, Tula, or Libra, Vrishchikam, Scorpio, were separated into three, Virgo and Scorpio were combined into one. This involved a doubling of the tetrad, or the tetractus reflected, describing the universe in thought, or subjectively perceived. With the emanation of the fifth hierarchy, Virgo and Scorpio split, and there was a fall and separation of the sexes. End quote. And um, Hindu tradition teaches that Virgo um, represents the energies of Shakti, while Scorpio uh, symbolizes the universe that's expanded just prior to it coming into material existence. Now, between these is Libra, which stands at the balance. Um, and this kind of paves the way to Nara, or the earthly Adam. Um, now, and here's another quote here. The Vishnu Purana speaks of the seventh creation as that of man, while the eighth is called a blind and refers to a purely mental process leading to the cognition of the ninth creation, that of the Kumaras, wherein the fruits of the labors of those Dhyanis who incarnated within the senseless shells of the first two root races was realized culminating in the creation of self-conscious divine men. The signs of Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio are critically important in attempting to understand this great mystery, for in them the potentials that slumber in Leo become distinct and separate elements, a necessary condition for manifested creation. Thus, the necessary separation of Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio results in manifestation and generation, while the union of the three brings about the destruction of the phenomenal universe. And so I think what's being implied here is that, um, you know, in a, in a period so much farther in the future, that eventually Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio will again combine into one again. But right now, it's kind of this... Um, this, I guess, separation that is needed, the subjective and the objective is needed. We need this split between the two. Now, the sixth sign of the zodiac is Virgo. And this, this symbol is the starry virgin, which typically represents purity and justice. Virgo is associated with the, the element of earth. And at, this is a very critical point in the Zodiac because um, there's this kind of final descent of spirit into matter before getting to the balance point. And um, very often this is depicted in many myths. Um, and you'll see here from this quote. The Virgin is depicted in various myths as leaving the world by abduction into the underworld or by falling into the clutches of the great dragon. As Astrea, Persephone, Isis, Ishtar, or Virgo, she is the pure vessel made clay, the fresh waters tainted with the monsoon's muddy torrents. Both her departure and her involuntary descent are linked up with the fall of spirit into matter and the heroic struggle of the imprisoned soul to maintain its link with its divine origin. End quote. So you can see that the uh, Virgo, having lost her innocence, is kind of stripped of her powers and stricken with disease um, in many of the myths. And this kind of symbolizes the soul that becomes really painfully enmeshed in physical existence and experience. Um, the Nidana that's associated with Virgo is called Sparsha, which means contact 
um, or contact with the outer world. Um, it also means touch. So the soul is kind of, a, it's become equipped with senses and sense organs and contacts the world um, now through the astral medium. Now here's another quote. Virgo um, or Kanya, containing the six shaktis, is symbolized in the two triangles of ascent and descent. The crown in their center representing the seven facets of her unified existence and the triangles indicating the elements of fire and water, end quote. Now, Mercury is the ruler of this sign, um, and it's um, Mercury is usually seen as the messenger of the gods. And so Virgo, being in connection with Mercury, is has this association of kind of this... Um, this uh, supreme kind of expression um, of the consciousness of the divine will. So the modality of this sign is mutable and um, more of a sattvic type of nature. And this suggests um, a kind of cool um, flexibility um, of and, and capable of assimilation is needed. Um, and here's uh, another quote to end this section. With the cool synthesis of these vast forces in nature, the crown of Kanya is achieved, sig signifying total purity of soul in its clear reflection of Daivi Prakriti, the light of the Logos. The perfected man who wears upon his head the crown of Virgo belongs to the arcane ranks of those who think feel, move, and breathe with the breath of divine will, end quote. Now here we have Libra, our seventh sign, and this kind of stands in equilibrium in the th um, equilibrium of the three worlds. And the symbol commonly associated is the scales. These are kind of the scales of harmony and justice, and they keep the balance between the celestial and the terrestrial worlds or the mic the macrocosm and the microcosm um, as well as the spiritual ego and the personal ego of man and libra is also identified with vedana as the seventh nidana um, and this translates as feeling so vedana means uh, feeling which brings into kind of uh, the action of influence of the higher mind upon the senses and their relationship between um, external objects. Um, the element of air is the ruling element for Libra, and the planet is associated with it is Venus. And this symbolizes kind of the, the heart of the wise man. Um, that's able to balance the goodness of Virgo and the kind of evil desire re that represents Scorpio. Um, within kind of within the heart is the wisdom of the higher mind. So you have this um, connection between um, the buddhic and um, higher manas. Now Libra is associated in the east with Nara Narayana, which is called the eternal man. And quote, Nara is the original eternal man as a unit reflection of the overbrooding macrocosmic potential. The human soul is now endowed with perceptive powers, which allow it to weigh in the balance of the higher mind, the experiences of the phenomenal world. End quote. Now, the higher mind illuminates the lower nature with knowledge. And because awareness, it can we can see awareness as equal to responsibility. You know, the degree of awareness is equal to the degree of responsibility that one is able to um, take on. And so it's at this point in the zodiac um, where choice, the honest of choice is can rest more heavily upon the soul. 
um, at this point, there needs to be a great effort to move back up the zodiac, back towards um, shifting into this evolutionary, this um, etherealization of matter, you know, lifting matter, dense matter up to the heights of spirit. And so there's an incredible responsibility that needs to come with this growing awareness that has been developing at this point. Now, um, we can kind of look at the the hidden lesson that, that lies in, in Libra, is that we kind of need to persistently see through and transcend the pairs of opposites. We have, um, you know, the two scales, but what lies between two... Um, two points or a polarity if we gain a little bit of elevation is always going to be the third point which creates a triangle and so i kind of see libra as um always trying to find the middle way gaining some kind of elevation in order to make the duad into the triad Now, there's a kind of an amazing um, power of self-consciousness that's been developed. Um, and in general, you know, man, if we just think very simply that man has this incredible gift of self-consciousness. And, th you know, this within this gift that we have been giving, it lies this um, capacity or potential to eventually harmonize our inner and outer natures um, and to kind of um, dissolve the barriers between the two. And so this is represented in Libra as well. And it's it's like the, the disciple kind of learns to harmonize um, his self with the outer world, and that can take place through sacrifice um, self-sacrifice, the development and cultivation of compassion, and, um, of course, right relationship with other beings. Libra is typically symbolized, um, as the, the sign of relationships. And so I think that this is really key, um, how we're relating to our inner and outer worlds. Um, and here's another quote. So, refining thus refining the mental astral and physical vestures it causes the micro centers of consciousness to reflect their macrocosmic sources and then the, the the disciple becomes a creative agent in helping on the work of cosmic evolution so this kind of uh, refinement of our, our vestures um, allows um, consciousness in um, our the micro centers of our consciousness to reflect the macrocosmic counterpart, and therefore the the student is able to become a creative agent in helping um, cosmic evolution. And we can see that now at this point in the zodiac, at this bottom point, this is incredibly important for the soul to then make a choice. Um, kind of a, a very defining choice um, to ascend back up. Now, the, the, la the eighth sign in the zodiac is called Scorpio, and its symbol is often depicted as a scorpion. So we said previously in Leo that there was, um, I guess, this this force of energy that was kind of lit up in Leo and that it eventually carries on all the way through Scorpio in which this separation takes place. Um, and so this is very key here. Um, now that symbolically the, the, we can look at the scorpion kind of this sim symbolism of the scorpion like the the sting of of the tail of the scorpion can suggest like a, a prospect of of lightning um, being struck, and um, 
the danger that's also present there. Um, so in Scorpio here, humility is really important because humility is really needed to uh, to try to attempt to control the good and evil potential that's kind of locked up in Scorpio. And the element here is water. And so from Aries all the way down to Libra, this creative, the creative life force can be seen to be operating externally. But now in Scorpio, there's a shift from involution to evolution. And so the life force becomes more internalized and indrawn um, because now it's about um, etherealizing matter the reasc the reascent back up to spirit and so there's this um emphasis on the internal nature rather than the external um and then a uh, a reservoir it said that a reservoir of heart energy kind of gets built up for the soul here um for later use now the ruling planet traditionally of mar of scorpio is mars and it kind of holds the place of death in a way, in the sign of Scorpio. And it's kind of this culmination of the separative process which began in Aries. Um, like I said previously, um, and then was kind of this bigger spark in Leo, from Aries to Leo, and now in Scorpio. And so the Nidana that's associated with Scorpio is called Tanha, craving or thirst. And this thirst arises out of comic comma, the sensations of comma, of desire, and feelings that are coming in from the previous sign of Libra. And this hunger or craving for activity and um, or the desire and craving for manifestation, that's what is said to bind us to the real of the wheel of rebirth. Now um, in Helen Valborg's articles, she she says that Fohat becomes fully awakened in Scorpio, and it needs to be brought under subdued control, which this requires the fixed modality of Scorpio. And here you can see the quality of um, the fixed quality of Thomas. Um, it's actually necessary to kind of dampen that down, to subdue the desires um, so that they can be brought under control. Quote, the conquering of Trishna, which Trishna is the Sanskrit name for Scorpio. So the conquering of Trishna within the battlefield of the human heart requires the transmutation of the energy of desire, which must find coherence in a secret place secluded from the out from the outward arenas of human existence. It is solely in the wisdom heart that the radiant knowledge of pragna and the skillful means of bringing people to enlightenment, upaya, can be joined in perfect interpenetration, merging mind and matter, theory and practice, into a pure and contented wholeness. In this way, trishna can be quenched, tanha may be stilled, and the insane longings of human existence seen for what they truly are. When this is calmly completed, man may proceed with the sacred task of preserving the pure love, the compassionate ray that springs upward from bodhicitta and illuminates the whole world. End quote. Now here we have the ninth sign of the zodiac, which is Sagittarius. Um, this, the sign is, uh, normally symbolized by the centaur, which has the body of a horse and the torso and head of a man. And the centaur is holding a bow and arrow. Now the bow and arrow is kind of symbolic of the fiery aspiration and the focus that's required to hit the mark, so to speak. Um, Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter and the element of fire and this gives a tendency for kind of loss lofty aspiration and more expansive qualities um 
expansive kind of abstract idealism, as well as the kind of fiery nature of it gives this in enthusiasm and desire to manifest them. So Sagittarius is linked up with the collective thought forms of humanity. And um, we can also see it as the higher mind, which stands in relation to Gemini, which is directly opposite it. Now, Sagittarius is a mutable sign, which again gives a kind of flexibility and an adaptability that's gained. Um, this is kind of a sattvic quality that's gained from all the rich experience from past life, um, or what's called the gathering of the fruit, um, which is an assimilation of all of the lower forms of intelligence. And Interestingly enough, Sagittarius is linked with the um, ninth nidana, which is called upadana, which means clinging or grasping. So the soul kind of needs to learn how to burn away all of the dross of past experience and kind of choose to cling and grasp at that which is higher. Um, so it's you can almost see it similarly as um, its opposite sign of Gemini, um, but that it's a much further refinement that's taking place here than what occurs in Gemini. And quote, the bow, full, fully drawn and ready to let fly, is the emblem of divine power, embodying the tension of spiritual force. Through the hand of the fiery Kshatriya, who grips the bow, the arrow will be released. He mirrors the power of the creative logos and ever draws upon the source of spirit. A steady gaze, firm stance, and complete openness to the heartbeat of the universe are required if the pilgrim soul would loose the arrow of its being from a perfectly balanced bow and strike the very center of the spiritual sun. Now, I forgot to mention in the previous um, sign here, but it's very interesting. There's a particular um, portion of Scorpio at the end, which is where the galactic center um, resides. Um, there's also a very important star in Scorpio called Antares. And so it's kind of said that the Sagittarius this, um, the centaur of Sagittarius has its bow and arrow pointed somewhere in um, Scorpio. So it's uh, an, kind of an interesting correlation and thought there. Now moving on to Capricorn. This is the 10th sign of the zodiac. And it's also known as Makara in Sanskrit. And the symbol is usually the goat or sometimes the fish goat. But in ancient Egypt, the symbol was uh, for Makara was the crocodile. And um, now Capricorn is commonly associated in exoteric astrology with kind of our structures, our institutions, order, and limitation. And this is really due to the influence, the really strong influence that Saturn has over the constellation. Quote, the Saturnian influence in Capricorn reflects the basic economy which reigns in the universe and which, though seemingly bountiful at times, in the end eliminates all that is superfluous to discover the bedrock necessities affecting the evolution of the soul. And so here you can see that Saturn is here to kind of bind and strip away. You can kind of think of the, um, the quote that the the devil frees in order to bind you and the divine binds you in order to free you and so you can think here in capricorn that this binding this kind of self limitation is what is is helping to strip away even further and ultimately can create the basis and ground for the greatest kind of creativity um, so now Makara or Capricorn is linked up with the 10th Nadana, which is called Bhava. And this, you could translate that as becoming. 
And uh, another good thing to mention is that Capricorn is one of the three earth signs. So we can see all of the earth signs as an expression of spirit that's bound in matter. So bhava um, or becoming is kind of a process that's naturally linked up with earth or the realm of form. And so beginning with Taurus um, and then moving on to Virgo and then finally Capricorns, we can see this kind of progressive unfoldment that takes place. Um, First, we have this fixed quality in Taurus and then the mutable or flexible quality with Virgo. And then finally, this very initiatory and creative dynamic refinement of spirit in matter with Capricorn. Um, Now, this is kind of the idea of Baba becoming um, is it's emulated by the Kumaras um, or also known as the dragons of wisdom, which they are seeking to uplift matter to the heights of spiritual consciousness. So um, Makara is linked up with the Kumaras and the desire that's expressed in the fifth creation or the fifth hierarchy, um, which is connected with the birth of the spiritual microcosm or man. And Capricorn kind of represents this compassionate descent of spirit into matter, as well as the becoming um, or the ascent out of it. Um, Here's the quote here. Capricorn marks the formation and hardening process, the work of Fohat which is critically related to the individuation of self. The denser limiting and solidifying vibrations enable the soul to know itself thoroughly as a self-conscious being, such that the ideal of Capricorn may become like a crystal, impervious, compact, and brilliant. We can think here of, um, in the voice of the silence, as the diamond soul. So Capricorn is closely related with the pentagram and also the number five, which um, if you think of this higher and lower, the macrocosm and microcosm, you can get five and five um, doubled, which becomes 10, um, the 10th sign. Now, Sri Raghavan Iyer in his article on the scope of self-consciousness, he says that the significance of man as a five-pointed star, a microcosmic reflection of the macrocosm, lies in his capacity to realize his solidarity with the fifth host of Dian Chohans, the Kumaras. If, when man stands erect, he is governed by that which enters through the crown of his head from above below, he is a minutia, capable of firm resolve. By raising his spiritual vision, he can at once look heavenwards towards the Empyrean and close the entire cosmos within his creative imagination. And here again, we have this um, idea of, um, you know, the binding or the idea of self-sacrifice. Um, what comes to mind is a, a really beautiful expression of, of Capricorn is the idea of um, spiritual vows, taking on commitments, becoming firm, um, becoming like a foundation, um, and becoming reliable. That's really what what is um, the soul is trying to learn here, is to become reliable, to take on limitation, to take on um, sacrifice um, for the sake of the whole. Now, the 11th sign is Aquarius, and the symbol for Aquarius is um, the water bearer, or it's, you know, man who's holding a vase of water and he's pouring it forth um, to earth. You can think of the water in the vase as the healing waters of wisdom, the Aquarian elixir, so to speak, and he's pouring it forth for thirsty humanity who is struggling. Um, so this is a very important sign. It's kind of a culmination of um, this whole journey, in a sense. 
And so the water bearers kind of representing the ideal um, to which humanity is moving. And we've, uh, we can think about the idea of um, individuation happening here um, in which the soul is really unifying with um, unifying with the whole um, but still like Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita who is Kutashta he still stands apart he still is um, is individuated has an individuality um, but within a greater whole and has learned the the tests that take place in Capricorn um, and is able to take greater responsibility. Now, um, I think that it's really important to point out here that um, Aquarius is actually ruled by the element of air, and many people often think of Aquarius as a water sign, and it's understandable because, you know, it's a water bearer. Even the glyph um, looks like two waves, you know, right, one over the top of each other. Um, but it's really important to see that Aquarius is an air sign um, here. Because air is symbolic of the mind. And what is able to take place here in um, Aquarius is um, the mind is really the agent, becomes the agent here. And so we have the kind of nature of the ruling planet, which is again Saturn here. It was Saturn for Capricorn and it's Saturn again for Aquarius. Um, so that nature of Saturn and the, um, the the natural modality is the fixed nature, right? The tamasic nature, um, so the subdued nature. And this kind of Saturn and the fixed quality gives this kind of cool aloofness, an airy disposition, um, kind of a dispassion that's reminiscent of the calm kind of unruffled detachment of Viraga. Um, here, you know, the, what I said previously, I'm um, at the end of the Capricorn slide about the Kutashta is incredibly relevant here because one needs a sense of um, critical distance in order to really use the mind properly. Um, you know, is it, the ability for ascent and descent here is very wide. Um, there's a movement up and down, so to speak. Um, now, I wanted to um, share a quote here, which I think is very telling. And, um, and it's very interesting. So this is from Helen Balborg. On the opposite side of the zodiac, the lion looks to the full emergence of the Aquarian man. The great potentialities of Leo in their highest aspect await the time of their manifestation in the ascending sign of the water bearer. In air, the most refined and powerful fire abides. And I think this says um, everything and nothing right here. Um, now, the Buddhist Nodana that's normally associated with Aquarius is Jati, which means birth, and it's reflected in the uh, more of the evolved Aquarius's ability to an, in, an inclination to freely give of the fruits of labor. And the, the, the developed Aquarian isn't protective of forms at all, but instead is trying to kind of break them up um, and promote new births of new ideation and new form. And this is partly why uh, modern astrologers kind of associate the planet of Uranus, um, which you can think of as the breaker of bonds in a way with Aquarius. And I think that there's a real truth to this association. 
um, and is important here. Now, here's another quote here from Helen Valborg, and um, which is kind of expressing more of the higher potentialities of Aquarius, but also this movement from Capricorn to Aquarius. Quote, if an Aquarian does not manifest the positive potential of this sign, but instead is passive, this tendency to disintegration of external forms may express itself as a hypersensitivity to criticism and an inclination to fall apart with its impact. Instead of transcending the pairs of opposites, the weak Aquarian becomes crushed by them. If Capricorn symbolizes a solidly independent rock-like stance, Aquarius represents a crumbling hillside of granite. The lessons of Capricorn must be learned well before the soul is ready to blossom fully in Aquarius. It is after passing the tests of Saturn that Fohat, which previously was propelling man, now becomes his self-conscious instrument. The lightning and thunderbolt are symbols of the mighty force that has been emerging with increasing strength from the sign of Scorpio onwards. The wavy glyph of Aquarius signifies the final manifestation of the undulatory forces of evolution. By taking in the waters of the supernal cup, the fully realized Aquarian obtains the perspective of the highest plane of the astral light, the universal solvent of Akasha. At a climactic point in its pilgrimage, it may lave in the elixir of life, the waters of immortality. When this moment is reached, by that one soul among millions, the highest spiritual source can flood the entire being, conferring boundless benefit to the whole of humanity. Now our last sign um, is the 12th sign of the zodiac, Pisces. The symbol for Pisces is usually the um, two fish. And of course the element here is water. And now Pisces marks the end of the zodiac, which is why the Nadana that's associated with Pisces is called Jamarana, which means, uh, or I'm sorry, Jaram, Jaramarana, which means death. And the actual constellation of Pisces is has this forked appearance, and it's said to be a cord, symbolizing a cord. Um, and you can see here in the glyph in the middle. Um, this cord unites these two fishes. So the Akkadian name for Pisces was dur -ki, which means the palace of the cord. Between the two fishes lies the seed, which could either bind the soul back to the wheel of samsara or per permit the full unification with the one. Quote, it is in Pisces that the final movement of dissolution is played out. The cord of Pisces will either bind the soul to the left-handed fish of involution, ensuring his rebirth through Aries the ram, or it will lead to liberation, the dissolution of all ties with earthly existence. End quote. Now, if the soul manifests kind of the watery and the mutable nature of this sign as a turbulence, so to speak, um, the turbulence of the lower, um, the lower emotional nature, then the karmic bonds will kind of um, ensure this submer submergence back into avidya or ignorance, which is in Aries. And so then a new turning of the wheel takes place. Um, now, here's another quote. If, however, the soul has drunk of the supernal cup, these powerful feelings can embrace the whole of ma mankind and the forces of love and sympathy released can actually transform the lives of others, end quote. So there's an incredible potential here um, that exists in Pisces, but it's, you can kind of think of this um, 
continuity that's taking place from Aries all the way through back to Pisces, all the way through the wheel. And so clearly, if certain karmic causes have been set in place, it won't really be possible for the, you know, the latter to occur. Um, but one will be propelled back into existence, into the matrix of Avidya. Um, so we we can kind of see this slow, gradual um, involution and evolution taking place, this connection through all of the signs. Now, traditionally, Pisces is ruled by the planet of Jupiter. And this, you know, of course, gives expansion. But in, in this sign, rather than this expansive fire that takes place in Scorpio, I mean, sorry, Sagittarius, the expansive um, property of, of Jupiter gives the expansion of compassion. And so the potential of compassion here is unmatched in than any of the other signs. Um, there's the idea of kind of parasotvic love, um, love that is even beyond um, attachment to the three gunas of Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas. That kind of love that wants nothing for itself um, and is completely focused on humanity. Um, now, it's. I think it's also important to mention that Neptune is a, a modern ruler that's associated with Pisces. Um, but Neptune, of course, it's not a sacred planet like um, so it's it's not really the traditional ruler. Um, now, New Neptune in its really highest aspect, Neptune along with Uranus, um, has an incredible ability to synthesize higher spiritual forces. But Neptune in its lower aspect brings this dreamy, lower, shifting kind of delusional nature, a chaos of the depths, so to speak. So that's why it's it's kind of double edged here in Pisces. Um, the the emotional nature can get the better of of one here, but if one is able to to take that um, the the feeling nature that's so intense here and kind of put it at the and insert one's um, pain and suffering into the whole of humanity and is is doing things on behalf of humanity, you can imagine that the potential of um, will really start to increase here. Now, um, here's another quote. And um, right before we end the Pisces sign. So H.P. Blavatsky wrote that the constellation of Pisces shines as a symbol of all the past, present, and future spiritual saviors who dispense light and dispel mental darkness. The great teachers who pass among men for a short time on earth personify the death of the personality and have taken on form only for the sake of others. This is deeply significant that such beings often suffer failure, betrayal, and even violent death. The soul is willingly crucified on the cross of matter in order that men may catch a glimpse of what they truly are. When Jesus was crucified, this seemingly terrible agony was a reenactment of the death of the lower aspects of the personality as they fell away from the liberated Christos. The dissolution was that of the lower quaternary, while the universal solvent which made it possible in the realm of pure lay, in the realm of pure akasha, the watery realm of the fully realized Pisces. The secret doctrine teaches that fish, sin, and soma are conjointly the three symbols of the immortal being. End quote. And here is the um, selection from the secret doctrine in which uh, she's speaking from the stanzas. Quote, the spark hangs from the flame by the finest thread of Fohat. It journeys through the seven worlds, becoming metal, stone, plant, and animal. 
From the combined attributes of these, Manu, the thinker, is formed. Who forms him? The seven lives and the one life. Who completes him? The fivefold law. And who perfects the last body? Fish, sin, and soma. End quote. So now here, um, before we end here, I would just like to go over some of the zodiacal relationships. Um, instead of looking at these all in a sequential order, can we look at the signs as, as connected in a different way? And so I'd like to do this through um, geometry. Now here we have a what's normally um, or what's considered to be an opposition. And an opposition is a division of the circle, or 360 degrees, divided by two, which gives 180 degrees of separation. Now, this energy between the two is polarized, and it's dynamic. Um, in order to balance the polarized nature, there's um, there's often a key so to speak, that's hidden in the opposing sign, which helps to kind of unlock it. It's, it's kind of reckon, reckoning two opposites in a way. And so we can really see, we can look at all 12 of the signs of the zodiac, or we can also see them as six pairs of polarities like this. So, um, you know, we, we pass through the, the wheel of life, the zodiac. And um, once we pass through the first six from Aries to, um, to Scorpio, I mean, to Virgo, then the second half, the seven through 12, can be seen as a kind of recapitulation of the qualities that exists in the opposite sign. Um, so our first example will be um, Aries and Libra. So we have Aries that represents this fiery emanation of this first step on the descent of spirit into matter. And then we have Libra, which is standing at the eternal equilibrium. So we have this be the beginning and then this um, equilibrium point. So both, in a sense, could be seen at being in balance with each other. Now, next we have Taurus and Scorpio. Um, while Taurus is kind of fixing its gaze on the goal ahead, the final separation eventually occurs in Scorpio. So there's kind of a one-pointedness in Taurus and a separation that takes place in Scorpio. And you can see those as these kind of opposite qualities. Now, then we have Gemini and Sagittarius. And I spoke a little bit about this before. Um, now, Gemini does represent, as Castor and Pollux, represents the lower and higher mind. But... Further, there's a, a further distinction between Gemini and Sagittarius. Gemini being the lower manas and Sagittarius being the higher manas. Um, I think that the, inte the intelligence and, and versatility, remember Gemini is that mutable quality. So the versatility of Gemini can be much more developed and refined in Sagittarius. Now, next, we have Cancer and Capricorn. Now, because Cancer is ruled by the moon, it reflects the light of Capricorn, which is directly opposite it. Um, in Capricorn, we have this idea of creativity through self-sacrifice or self-imposed limitation. We also had the association with the Kumaras or the Dionys. And so you can almost think, in a sense, of Capricorn being the Agnishvata Petris and the and Cancer symbolizing um, 
the lunar petris in a sense, or that reflected light of the unfolding power of form. Now here's a very interesting dynamic I have always thought. Um, we have Leo and Aquarius. Um, now Leo represents this selfhood. I mean, we all famously know of a Leo personality is has no problem putting themselves out in on the stage, for example. Um, and there's kind of this incredible search for creativity, but the Leo is is more concerned with self um, in a lower sense. And so Aquarius, what eventually gets recapitulated in Aquarius is this incredibly more refined nature of individuality um, through individuation, a process of individuating um, where one is still, um, one is completely unified in the higher and lower um, with internal and external, but still retains their individuality. Um, so we can also see the, um, the expression of the um, immortality um, or the, um, I think it's very often called the uh, philosopher's stone, which, you know, of course, isn't a stone itself, a physical stone, but man has the capability of becoming the philosopher's stone, able to turn lead into gold. But what he's turning into gold is really himself. He's refining his um, vestures to such a degree to where there's a full expression and capacity of the creativity of the microcosm in the macrocosm. Um, so I think this dynamic is very intriguing indeed. And then last we have Virgo and Pisces. And so if Virgo represented that final critical point of descent into matter, then Pisces is, of course, the critical point of um, the last step on the journey, so to speak, of the ascent to spirit. Okay, now next I'd like to go into the aspect of the trine. The trine is when you divide the circle, or 360 degrees, by three, and we have an equal um, degree separation of 120 degrees. And this is traditionally considered to be a very harmonious alignment. Um, and all of the signs, if there's ever a trine between two planets or two points, two signs, they will always be in the same element. And the first one that we'll discuss is fire. Fire can be seen as an expression of matter in spirit. Um, you know, this kind of passion in a sense. And we did discuss this a bit before. Um, we have this primal fire, this kind of untamed fire that's developed in Aries that then is continued over into Leo, which then we have this, um, um, the fixed nature in Leo tames and controls it and then eventually moves on to Sagittarius, which is a mutable sign. And so that fire then becomes very refined. Um, so we have the uncontrolled, the controlled, but then a further refinement. And next we have earth signs. These are expressions uh, or can be seen of expressions of spirit in matter. Now we first have Taurus in which you can see a very fixed stability, um, a fixed expression here. And then in Virgo, it starts to become flexible here um, because that's that critical point. And then further in Capricorn, there's this re beautiful refinement of um, spirit and matter, matter, which is which is why um, it's often said that the the vehicle of the new man will be built in Capricorn. And 
next we have air, which we can think of that as an expression of manas or the mind of ideation um, or of thought. And in Gemini, it's a mutable sign. So we get this kind of chaotic shifting mind, um, this duality that's present there. And then it pr progresses on to Libra, where there's um, more of a balanced thought. Um, it's gaining some kind of um, of harmony. And then f finally in Aquarius, where it becomes so refined um, that it actually, the, the power of Manas um, can actually be harnessed and used as a real instrument to aid uh, collective humanity. And here we have water, which we can see this as um, perhaps an expression of heart intelligence. So beginning in cancer, that compassion is, you can see it as reflective. Um, it is elementary in a sense because it hasn't really developed its own, it hasn't become a lamp unto itself. Um, it's able to express the, the heart, um, but not of its own source. Um, and then in Scorpio, it kind of wells up this fixed reservoir of um, of the intelligence um, of the capacity of the heart, which eventually becomes um, expanded and expanded in Pisces, where you know, of, of course, there's a a, a, a final. Um, conquering of the lower nature, a disillusion, um, a death fully of of the old and a, a capacity to express um, sacrificial um, compassion for the sake of all. Now next we'll look at what's called the square. And this is the, the circle, which is divided by four, which equals a 90 degree separation. Now, this is typically thought to be um, conflicting energy, and, but it's dynamic. And it can also bring about a certain creative tension. And so another thing to note here is that the signs that are square to each other will always share the same modality. And by modality, we mean either um, mutable, fixed, or cardinal. And that's in the Western system. Now in the Eastern system, you can think of, it at, think of it as the gunas, the three gunas. And so the mutable would be sattva, um, the fixed would be tamas, and then the cardinal would be Rajas. Now, our first, we'll be looking at the cardinal signs. These are expressions of creative, initiatory, Rajasic action. And they progress through in Aries, and then Cancer, Libra, and then finally in Capricorn. Next, we have the fixed signs, which are the expressions of, you know, this fixed action. But I don't want to, I think it's important not to think about it as good or bad. Um, we think of Thomas and we normally think of, of something that's bad. But it's really speaking about um, the subdued um, nature. There's a point where one needs to become fixed. One needs to develop reliability. And so I think this is what is really um, being developed here with these four signs, beginning with Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and then Aquarius. And then lastly, oh, before we move on to the, um, to the next four, I did want to mention here that, um, now these are called the four cardinal stars. Now these are not the four cardinal signs, but they're incredibly important. And so I wanted to read a, um, a quote here from Helen Valborg. Now we have Taurus, we have 
the star of Aldebaran. In Regulus, I mean, in Leo, we have the star of, of Regulus. And in Scorpio, we have the star of Antares. And finally, in Aquarius, at the feet of Aquarius, we have Fomalhaut. And so these are very important stars forming a cross in the sky. Um, quote, Regulus marks the heart of the lion. And since Leo is in the house of the sun, it is considered to rule the human heart. Together with Fomalhaut, which rests at the feet of Aquarius, Aldebaran, the eye of Taurus, and Antares in the constellation of Scorpio, Regulus forms one of the four celestial cardinal points. It is one of the guardians of heaven, which are said to act of themselves. They are cardinal locas, which oversee the processes of evolution. They contain the mystery that lies behind the throat, the heart, the generative organs, and the earthbound feet of the great sacrifice, which is man, the microcosm. Now moving on to the mutable signs, which are expressions of this fluid kind of sattvic action, which of course can have its downside in a way because you can you can get a certain type of personality, um, you know, one that's very ruled by the personality. And this is where you'll you'll get people um, or personalities that when they are in a room full of people, um, they they morph themselves to whoever they're they're around. Um, they're not, they could very often be chameleons in a sense. Um, but in the higher aspects, the the mutable quality brings on a flexibility of mind. Um, so this begins in Gemini, um, progresses to Virgo, then Sagittarius, and finally ends in Pisces. Now, the, the last relationship that I wanted to um, speak about is the sextile. Now, this is similar to the trine. And if you take a circle and divide it by six, you'll get a 60 degree separation. And this, just like the trine, this aspect is, is harmonious. Um, it's not quite as harmonious as the trine is, but um, it's similar. And what happens here is that there's a harmony amongst elements. Um, you have pictured here is the three earth signs of Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn. And then we have the three water signs of Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces. Now it's said that the water and earth signs are, are harmonious together. Um, and you can even see this represented in the, in the alchemical glyph. Um, they're both downward pointing triangles. Um, and so I think that's very telling that there's an association there. And then the other set would be the air and fire signs. So the air signs would be Gemini, Libra, and Aquarius. And then the fire signs are Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. And so these six signs will be in harmony with one another. Now, I'd like to end the presentation here from a quote from Sri Raghavan Iyer, and just to kind of bring this down to earth a little bit better. Um, now, this is from the Gupta Vidya, Volume 3, from his article, Integration and Recurrence. Quote, a complex picture emerges of a myriad overlapping cycles and subcycles on several planes of existence, whilst the enormous breadth and depth of cyclic phenomena would render elusive any exacting analysis of cycles for the neophyte in Gupta Vidya, one should attempt to nurture a cool apprehension of the regular periodicity in the excitement of mental and physical forces affecting both collective and distributive karma. Now, it may help to begin with a relatively simple example. Consider the case of a single family within a larger household and a local community.
each member of the family is born at a different moment. Each, therefore, has a different constellation in the ascendant at the moment of birth. And each has different cycles determined by the positions of the moon, the planets and the stars in the heavens at the moment of birth. For each, the angular relationships between these sidereal bodies and their placement relative to the zenith and horizon in the place of the individual's birth will vary. Already, at the simplest level, one can see an inherent complexity to the cyclic destiny of every individual. Within the lifetime of the individual, a variety of cycles and subcycles will operate, some marked off by septinates of years and having to do with the incarnation of the higher principles, and others governed by a cycle slightly more than 18 years, having to do with the revolution of the nodes of the moon, Rahu and Ketu. Each of these cycles will have its own subcycles, and these in turn will be comprised in still smaller cycles, down to those which may last only a few weeks, a few days, even a few hours. Nor should it be forgotten that several people live together in families, and that there is a close interaction between what is happening in the orbit of the father, the mother, the children, and the ancestors of each. Owing to the complex overlapping and intersecting of the mathematics applying to each individual and to a specific group of individuals, one might think of constellations of energy fields wherein many people produce an immense clustering of elements, all of which obey the law of cycles. If one passes from the limits of a single family to the scope of a mini commune or even a small community, it is evident that the degree of complexity involved in comprehending the cycles at work will become very great. End quote. Now, now, if anyone has any comments or questions, I will try my best to take them up now. Thank you. Um, that was excellent, Michelle. Um, wow. Wow. Really comprehensive. Amazing. Thing. Um, I had a, a question myself. Um, there seems to be an emphasis on archetypes and also on this idea of the pilgrimage and a great journey. And there's this journey through the elements, uh, through these modalities, through the through the planets, through these archetypes, excuse me, uh, through these nidanas, okay, mm -hmm. and through these archetypes. What would you say is the difference between a journey through the archetypes as opposed to a journey through a series of personalities? Through a series of personalities? Yep. Um, well, I mean, you can look at the, there's so many different ways that you can look at the Zodiac. Um, you know, traditional, what, what you'll find when you look at astrology, it's, it's basically all personality uh, interpretation, um, there. And that's, it's totally relevant. Um, I won't say that it's, there's no truth to it. Because you can definitely look at astrology through that lens. Um, and it will bring up a lot of insight in that way. But I think that there's a, a particular point in the evolution of the soul where it's it's really, you know, beginning on a different path, remembering more of, of who that soul really is. And so I think that the archetypes become really relevant and important because they represent living forces. You know, these, um, these energies that we're speaking of are, um, you know, connected with the highest um, creative beings in our cosmos. And so you can see as kind of being put under the protection, um, so to speak, um, when one is born in that particular sign, now, I, I do want to make um, a point that the, the sun sign that one is born in does not necessarily mean that that's the sign under which you are currently in your incarnation. Um, I don't think that we should go into interpretation at all with it. Um, but I just want to kind of say that, that um, 
most of what you're seeing in an astrological chart is going to be a representation of the personality. Um, and it, it's, it's not necessarily significant to, to look at that and say, this is what the soul is going through. Um, because that is so much more mysterious. And, um, you know, I think only um, initiates and adepts can really um, say and make real interpretations in that way. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Am I supposed to be seeing hands? I don't think I... I don't know. If you maybe you could unshare. Oh, there I see Desiree's got a yeah, Desiree's got a question. Oh, okay. Can you share? Hi, Michelle. Wow, it's a what a lot of work you put into that. Thanks so much for for that gift and sharing it. And um, just in terms of archetypes, when I when I look at that beautiful wheel, I think also of a color wheel. And I know that you brought up color and number and how they're associated with these archetypes. But in a color wheel, when you look to the opposite, you find um, the color that is, I guess, the, um, I don't know, it's kind of like the, the sister or the brother of the other color, the opposite. And I was wondering, and because I do not know that much at all about astrology, but is there is there a, an association, a special association between one sign and its exact opposite on the yes. cycle? Could you explain that? Yes, I was actually. I have all these different signs of uh, slides about um, about all of the different relationships here. Um, sorry, one second. And so. I, you know, I went, I've gone into here on the screen, I've gone into um, basically the main aspect patterns that you'll find in astrology. So the opposition um, is the, you take the circle and you divide it by two, and that gives you 180 degrees separation from one another. And this is very polarized and dynamic. And so often, um, in order to balance the polarization, there's kind of a key that's hidden in the opposing sign, which helps to unlock it. So you can you can look at the the twelve signs, or you can also look at kind of um, six pairs of of these polarities, um, if if that makes sense. And so I can go through some of these right here. And so Libra, um, Aries and Libra stand opposite one another. We don't. And so, um, and so, you know, Aries is the first sign. Libra is the seventh sign. And so you have this kind of fiery emanation of this descent from Aries. And you can look up across the zodiac and you see this, um, this balance point of Libra. Um, which is this kind of equilibrium point before this reascent back to the source. And then um, and then we can go to Taurus and Scorpio. And so there's this one pointed um, gaze from Taurus and then this kind of final separation that occurs in Scorpio. Sorry, I'm trying to go a little fast through this. Now, Gemini, Sagittarius, you can look at these as the, the lower mind and the higher mind. And then Cancer and Capricorn. Now, this is a very mysterious portion of the sky um, in Capricorn because it's linked with the, you know, the fifth host, um, the Kumaras and the Dhyanis. And so if you think of cancer as being the moon, in a sense, that's reflecting that light, reflecting that, that higher light from Capricorn onto the world. Um, and then when, when the soul actually gets to Capricorn, there's this intense, uh, you know, limitation that takes place through self-sacrifice. And that actually brings this amazing create, creative potential um, building 
in Capricorn. And then in now, Leo and Aquarius are opposites. And you can think of Leo as this universal self, um, this selfhood. I mean, the, the Leo personality is incredibly strong. I think everybody knows what, um, you know, the strong Leo personality. Um, but in Aquarius, it's a different kind of energy because it's, um, you know, Leo is, is more about uh, kind of me-centered, you know, and Aquarius is more um, about the unity within the whole, um, the immortal individuality. Um, and so it's, it's a different kind of expression, but you see that there's these different balances of similar points here. And then the last one, um, you can look at this in so many different ways, but um, Virgo can be seen as that final descent, that kind of critical point of descent into matter, and then Pisces as the final ascent um, into spirit. And there are lots of other um, associations, actually, uh, that I have here. Um, it's it's interesting to look at the, the trine, um, which is 120 degrees, um, you know, all of those um all of those when when there's a trine between different signs this is going to be very harmonious and they're all going to say share the same element as each other and so you'll get the the same element of fire um the element of of earth air and then water and you can see this kind of progression around the zodiac um for example, um, with this one, um, you know, water is kind of an expression of of heart intelligence or compassion, and it kind of is only purely reflective in Cancer. Then it gets built up in Scorpio, and then finally is able to be released in Pisces. So I hope that that helps a little bit. Um, yeah. Here with your question, I would love to go into more of this. Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. This is, is such a great presentation. Thank you so much. The question I have is in one of your earliest slides, um, you talked about how uh, psychologists were going are going to have extra work to do. Um, and I think it, it, you... Uh, it, it referred to it moving into the Aquarian age. There it is. Yes. And, and so I I was just wondering uh, what that means. Are we um, collectively experiencing uh, an input of more energy to, to assimilate? Or what is that that is causing... Um, because I've heard this referred to before about the Aquarian age and the um, increase in psychological um, trouble and possible trauma. Yes. yes. Through the signs. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, Aquarius is a is an air sign, and so it's naturally related to the mind and. The previous sign uh, was Pisces, and so that is a water sign. And so there's kind of a huge shift that's taking place, um, basically this kind of shift in um, from the feeling nature um, to explosive emotions and passions, because um, that's kind of the, the lower qualities of the expression of, of, of a Piscean nature. Um, over to this more elevated um, notion of Aquarius, which is really having to do with the mind and responsibility. And so I think because we're also in Kali Yuga at this time, there's a huge quickening of, of everything related to um, 
the lower nature. There's a, there's a, you know, everything outward in the world is an expression of, of, I guess, uh, or put in another way, I think that, that everything that's happening in our world isn't really what's going on. There's a, um, most of our society is completely centered around materialism and um, lower qualities. Um, and so I think that another thing is that we have this plethora of images, um, you know, in our current society with all of the technology that has come in, you know, Aquarius rules technology. Um, that's the influence of Uranus on on the sign of Aquarius. And so you can imagine that anytime there's a, a shift, um, whether that happens in one's own sphere, in one's own life, um, anytime there's a shift, there's always um, the opposite forces trying to, um, you know, bring bring that off of balance or, or to for that transition to not occur. And so I, I think there's a, just a huge karmic sorting out of past karma, um, collective karma, personal karma. I mean, you can look at astrology from so many different lenses. You can look at the individual. You can look at a group. You can look at a larger group, um, a, you know, a country, um, or look at things in kind of the light of the whole. And so there's these, there's so many forces moving at the same time. And another important thing to take into account is that, you know, our, all of our structures are kind of shifting now. And, um, you know, Pluto, the, the planet of um, transformation, death, is just moved into the sign of Capricorn, which is, sim it, that symbolizes all of our institutions, our government, our structures. And so you can imagine this, um, um, you know, things are breaking down, things are burning down in a way, and they need to do that in order to pave, pave the way for, for the new that's eventually, you know, going to unfold. It's, I, I really like the analogy of a kind of a forest fire in a way. Things get burnt down. And, uh, but what do you have left over? You have this incredible carbon that's left in the soil. And that allows for so much growth to occur afterwards. And so we're at this kind of critical point where we need to shift um, and take responsibility um, for our own sphere instead of putting it outward on, on others um, or pressuring other people to change. We each need to make those own choices within our own sphere. Um, and, and I think that we, can make huge, make big, big shifts in a way if, if people are more quiet, um, you know, spending more time in meditation, um, not being overtly outward in their expression, and just can become committed with, you, you know, really using the power of the mind um, in a responsible way. Um, and I think that would greatly help um, humanity as a whole. Thank you so much, Michelle. That really clears it up a lot. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, there was a question in the chat, which I think you've covered really. Um, what lessons are there to be learned in the Aquarian age? And does Judy have a sign? Uh, hey? Oh, did you? You, I mean, if you if you want to comment on that, I mean, you've really. Well, covered, I think covered. I would add a little bit to that. Um, okay. You know, the we have the Aquarian axiom um, about you know sacrificing um, to the whole, and the idea of sacrifice of of harmony um, and of using the mind correctly and taking responsibility. Um, I think these are really key lessons to learn. I mean, Aquarius is really the sign of humanity. And, um, and so it's within this kind of whole community, one can stand out in a sense, 
um, within one's own sphere and anything that, um, that one does can be consecrated in a way to the whole. And I think if we, if we learn, um, to, to do that, um, small things, it doesn't need to be big gestures in a way, but small things Mm -hmm. quietly, um, you know, thinking about even using the mind in a way that one normally doesn't, um, contemplating great ideas, um, you know, thinking about great mm-hmm. beings, all of these add, they all help to kind of clear out the, um, I guess, the the kind of astral cloud that we're all living in, in a way. So all of these things can help. Um, and it's kind of in every moment. And one, one of the big shifts from the Piscian age is this idea that there's something outward, some leader or some something that's going to save everybody. And I think that we need to learn that, that we're doing that ourselves. There's, you know, nobody's going to come and save us. Um, it's not going to be some big, some political leader. Um, you know, we, we have to take responsibility in our own sphere. Um, and, and even I think the idea of linking up um, in smaller communities um, is a good idea. And using the power of the, you know, the technology of the internet, I think in a more responsible way as well. Um, but those are just a few ideas, definitely not exhaustive. Very glad you chose to add, add some more. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Judy? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, the sun seems to be moving backward through the zodiac from Pisces to Aquarius. I know some people do not understand this and they think it's moving the other way. Um, they think the precession of the equinoxes is um, affecting it and that it's where the earth is pointing. And I've been telling this person it's the position of the sun and the zodiac that counts. So um, uh, really, my question is, how does the precession of the equinoxes uh, affect our uh, perception of the zodiac? I mean, I I have been told that um, although I'm born under the sign of the Aquarius, um, that I'm actually uh, a Capricorn, which uh, yes. doesn't seem to be yeah, reasonable. Yeah. It has That's to do with, you know, go ahead. That's- Really great question. It really is because um, I think I think a lot of people um, feel that way as well. And I think you know, if it's it can all often feel like um, you know whatever system. If one is naturally from the east, they tend to always look at the Vedic system, the sidereal system. And so I think that the way in which one first um, learned one sign is an influence as well. But um, I think that this kind of, this might be difficult to convey, but this misalignment, so to speak, that we kind of have between the tropical and the sidereal zodiacs is kind of emblematic of our collective lens um, that we look through how um, in the West. Um, how things are kind of, they're kind of off in a way. We're not really focused as a society on, um, on the real, the true and the spiritual. And, um, but that being said, I think that there is still a lot of relevance to the tropical system. And, you know, one of the ways that you can kind of remedy the, the issue is to read for both of the read for both of the signs. Um, you can also use the tropical system and, and superimpose the fixed stars on top of it. And that, um, for example, if somebody has a planet that is um, conjunct or on top of a, a certain star, that's going to give a certain coloring to the, the force that's at work in that person's life. 
in that person's personality. Um, but another thing to take into account is that if you look at the angles, the mathematical angles um, mm -hmm. that's involved in your chart, that's going to be the same no matter what zodiac you're using. Um, so all of those aspects, the, the mathematical aspects, um, when you're looking at a chart, those will always be the same no matter what what system you're using. And so I think it takes a, a particular um, astrologer to really um, to reconcile those two. Um, but I hope that helps. It's it's definitely a, an issue um, that we have in the systems. But um, I'd really say that the, it's kind of both. Michelle, that was masterfully done on yes. this ad talk. Wow. Um, just, just huge gratitude. That's all I got to, to say. And um, we're very inspiring. Just um, And uh, next week, it'll be, is that true, Capricorn? Yes. Capricorn. Yeah, Capricorn. Yes. Um, I better get that together because it's going to be me. <laughs> so, BTW. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right well thank you so much and um we're just most grateful so great michelle thank you uh, thank you that was just yeah. great beautiful i'm Good sorry night. i was able to finish what's that it was good oh okay. all right yeah take care everybody cool. thanks be safe, bye -bye. Good season be well and yeah. safe